Do dairy products leave your gut feeling um, not so happy? Well, you're not alone. Experts estimate that around 70% of the world's population has lactose malabsorption, or also known as lactose intolerance. And in today's video, with the help of the cadavers here in the lab, we're going to discuss the causes, symptoms, and management of lactose intolerance. It's gonna be a gas. Let's do this. Lactose is what's known as a double sugar or disaccharide. So basically it's two sugar molecules, specifically glucose and galactose, that are linked together like Legos. Then when lactose gets into your system, it needs to be broken apart into that glucose and galactose so that your body can use them. Glucose is the real MVP here. It's an enormous source of energy for the cells in your body and it's a very stable molecule. Galactose on the other hand is much less stable. So it's actually gonna be converted into glucose, among other things, pretty quickly. But lactose is found in all kinds of dairy. So cheese, butter, milk, you name it. So that means when you're inhaling ice cream, like there's no tomorrow, it sounds delicious, the lactose actually needs to be converted into glucose so you can utilize that energy. At the root of lactose intolerance is an enzyme called lactase, which is what breaks down lactose. Now the gene that is responsible for the production of lactase is get this, called the lactase gene. And I'm not even upset at that. I wish everything was that easy and simple. But when we're born, this gene is running full bore because newborns obviously need glucose and they get it from the lactose inside of their mother's milk. But once an infant is weaned, this gene downregulates, meaning it produces less and less lactase until it reaches a baseline that is a far cry from where it once was if it's even working at all. This is what's commonly referred to as lactose intolerance. And the exact mechanism behind lactose intolerance is still not entirely understood, but we have a pretty good idea of what's going on, but it's just not fully there yet. But it's also important to understand that lactose intolerance is actually an umbrella term. And there are other terms that are gonna be underneath it that you'll probably hear from time to time, such as lactase non-persistence or lactose malabsorption. Just understand they're all in the family of lactose intolerance. Now, as I mentioned in the beginning of this video, roughly two thirds of the world's population has lactose intolerance to some degree. In the remaining one third, however, some individuals have what's known as lactase persistence, which is where that lactase gene never really downregulates, meaning they continue to produce high levels of lactase. These lucky people are typically descendants of those that domesticated cattle, and those people have been consuming milk for thousands of years. This means there's an environmental pressure, right? That's saying like, hey, Milk and lactase is still useful. Let's, let's not downregulate this gene so it remains upregulated and they just can consume dairy products like there's no tomorrow. The, I'm telling you, it's these lucky people. Right now, we typically see this in European populations, but we also do see this in some Middle Eastern and Asian populations. Now, to get super sciencey for just a brief moment, this is likely the product of five or more single nucleotide polymorphisms in a regulatory region called MCM6, which is located just before the lactase gene on chromosome two. So essentially, that means there are variations in proteins that regulate the lactase gene, which result in a continued lactase production. This is under the domain of epigenetics, which are so, so cool. Essentially, epigenetics are how the environment influence the DNA by deciding, or at least contributing to, which of the genes are on and which of the genes are off. So now that we've covered the Gouda and Cheddar of how lactose works, let's take a look at a real human digestive system and figure out what happens to it when you consume lactose. But real quick, I wanna thank the sponsor of today's video, AG1. AG1 has been sponsoring our channel for quite some time now, and their nutritional drink is something that I actually truly believe in. If they just stopped sponsoring our channel, I promise you, I would still continue to take AG1 because I believe in it that much. AG1 is foundational nutrition. It's made up of 75 whole food sourced ingredients, which includes vitamins, minerals, superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens. I personally take AG1 to help support my gut microbiota. As someone who's had real serious gut issues in my past, maintaining a good healthy gut microbiome is of the utmost importance to me. All you do is take one scoop, Add it to eight ounces of water and shake vigorously. I mean like really shake it. Put your best effort into it, people. And then from there, you're just gonna drink it and carry on with your day. Look, I'm the type of guy that is all about effortless daily habits. So knowing that a significant amount of my essential daily nutrition has been handled first thing in the morning is a huge weight off my shoulders. 
If you're interested, visit drinkag1.com slash humananatomy, and they'll give our audience a one year free supply of immune supporting vitamin D3 plus K2 and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Again, go ahead and find that link in the description below. You are looking at an anterior view of the abdominal cavity. So this massive organ in front of you is what's called the liver. And I'm gonna go ahead and lift that up so we can see the relevant aspects of the digestive system. So the first thing we can see is the stomach and that's this pink organ here. Now the stomach is gonna be transitioning into what's known as the duodenum. And if you look closely, I'm traversing it with my finger. This is the duodenum. It's the first and shortest segment of the small intestine, and it's a C-shaped structure that's about 25 to 30 centimeters long, and it wraps around the head of the pancreas, which is this yellow structure you can see here. It's going to connect to the pyloric sphincter, which is the sphincter that separates the duodenum from the stomach, and it's also going to connect to the jejunum, which we will see in just a moment. But the duodenum has a thick muscular wall and mucosal layer that comes with circular folds, but no villi. You are now looking at a different small intestine from another donor here in the lab. But as you can see, we've made an incision that allows us to reflect it back and see the inside of the small intestine. This space is what's called the lumen, and it's the space in which the digestive material will be traveling through. But you can also see these ridge lines. These ridge lines are called circular folds, and they're going to increase the surface area of the small intestine. But if we could zoom into the circular folds, you'd also see these tiny little appendages called villi. The villi have blood vessels, and that's what absorbs nutrients into the bloodstream. But on the surface of those villi are microvilli. And those microvilli and the secretions that rest on those microvilli create what's called the brush border. And that brush border is gonna be vital to our understanding here in just a moment. I'm now going to reflect this tissue here called the greater omentum back so we can see the jejunum. Now, if you look closely, you can see the duodenum as it's transitioning into the jejunum. And it does this at what's known as the duodenojejunal flexure. And so this right here is the beginnings of the jejunum. Now this is thick and muscular and has a wide diameter in comparison to the rest of the intestine we'll see in a moment. It also has thick circular folds and a lot more villi than that distal segment, making it highly specialized for nutrient absorption. And if I go like this, you'll even be able to see that the intestines, and this is going to include the duodenum as well as the more distal segment, are connected with something called the mesentery. And you can see there are a ton of blood vessels. So you can picture those circular folds, those circular folds along with, say, the microvilli and villi absorbing the nutrients down into the mesentery, which will then take it towards the liver in order to be processed. But if I just go like this, I'm gonna show you just how long this is. So in order to say, like, when does the transition happen from the jejunum to our next segment, the jejunum is about two-fifths or so of the length of the small intestine. So then that makes the distal three-fifths, which I'm just gonna kind of go back, which we're, I don't know, maybe we could say is about right here. This is now transitioning into the ileum. Now the ileum is the last segment of the small intestine. So it's a smaller diameter than the jejunum. Um, there's not gonna be as many circular folds. It's not as thick. Uh, there's not as many villi. But what's gonna be happening here is the absorption of vitamins, bile salts, electrolytes, and you can see that the blood vessels in the mesentery are also gonna be much reduced, right? Because we're, this is not the area that's specialized for absorption and digestion like the jejunum was. And then the ileum is going to end, and where it ends is at what's called the ileocecal valve, which is the connection between the ileum and the large intestine. So let's now discuss in greater detail this brush border, because this is, as they say, where the magic happens. Now the brush border, again, are the microvilli and their secretions that are located on the villi, that are located on the circular folds that are in the small intestine. And if we were to zoom into those microvilli, we'd see that those are actual extensions of epithelial cells. And those epithelial cells are what produce lactase, or more appropriately, it's kind of like an inactive form of lactase, because once they produce it, they'll transport that inactive form to the external surface. So like on the outside of those microvilli, so they're inside the hollow tube of the small intestine. 
That way they can interact with digested material. So this is pretty much anything that's at that brush border is just going to be sitting there in anticipation of digested material that will interact with it. And when it goes into that lumen, that's where it becomes activated into actual lactase. Now the real name for lactase for humans that we produce is lactase fluorizin hydrolase. But we're just going to continue calling it lactase because that's a lot easier. So let's say you're eating ice cream. Well, that lactose is then going to interact with the lactase as it's traveling through the small intestine. And when that happens, well, everything we've already discussed is going to then roll out, right? So the lactase will break it down into glucose and galactose, which will then be absorbed by the body and then can be utilized in a number, number of other ways. But that's only if you have an upregulated lactase gene. If you don't have that, and you're eating the ice cream, all that lactose is just going to travel through the duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum until it makes its way to the large intestine. Now as digestive material makes its way from the ileum through the ileocecal valve and into the large intestine, it is now deemed waste because it wasn't able to be absorbed by the small intestine, so the body is saying, hey, we're not able to use this, let's just go ahead and get rid of it. Now the reason why this is called the ileocecal valve is because it connects the ileum to the cecum. The cecum is this blind-ended pouch, but it also happens to be the first portion of the large intestine. Now hanging off of it is what's known as the vermiform appendix. But then what's going to happen? So the material makes its way from the cecum, it's now going to start traveling up into what's known as the ascending colon. And it's going to head into the transverse colon. Now the transverse colon is crossing from the right side of the abdomen towards the left side. So I'm going to grab the small intestines, kind of shift those out of the way so we can see what we're looking at. So the, the feces is going to be traveling all the way over here, and now it's going towards what's known as the descending colon. And the descending colon is going down, but it's also going to be going behind a tissue which, that's known as the peritoneum, and that's all this yellow tissue you can see here. So the descending colon goes down, and then it transitions, again I'll slide this out of the way as best I can, into what's known as the sigmoid colon. The sigmoid colon is an S-shaped curve, and that is going to transition into the rectum. And the rectum is really just means straight, and this is going to connect to the anus, and that will take the feces to the outside world. Now, the overall function of the large intestine, from the rectum all the way going back towards that cecum here, is going to be absorption of water and salt, specifically just electrolytes. So the longer digestive material or feces spends inside of the large intestine, the more dehydrated it's going to become. But I just want to stress that from the body's perspective, if something is in here, it is essentially considered waste. So inside of the large intestine is bacteria, and a lot of bacteria at that, potentially billions to trillions of bacterial cells. But of those potentially trillion bacterial cells, there's only a few hundred bacterial species. But some of those species are able to break down lactose. So what will happen is they encounter lactose, they bring it inside of themselves, and then they have their own form of bacterial lactase, which can break it down into the glucose and galactose, and then they can use those sugars for their own energy. But by doing so, they create waste products. And their waste products are going to be short-chain fatty acids, as well as hydrogen, carbon dioxide, and potentially even methane gas. So think about it. As the gases start to accumulate, that can stretch out the large intestine which in a way can, side, can kind of simulate peristalsis, which is the natural wave-like contractions of the intestines, right? You don't have to think about moving matter, digested material, throughout your intestines. It's something that happens naturally. Well, the gases can start to simulate that and potentially stimulate peristalsis, which is going to play a role when it comes to the symptoms of lactose intolerance. Then, you also have to understand that lactose and many of these byproducts of the bacteria breaking down lactose can cause osmosis to occur, where water will be placed into the large intestine to help dilute all of the solutes. So you'll probably understand why the symptoms of lactose intolerance are the way they are. So bloating is really just the intestines expanding from those gases. Flatulence is because the gases need to go somewhere. Diarrhea is because water is rushing into the intestines to try and dilute the concentration of all the solutes inside of there. And then you'll even get abdominal pain, which is a product of cramping because of all the gases and just pressure inside of there. And then you'll even get nausea. Nausea is 
typically a product of your body just like, you know, I don't know what's going on. I'm just gonna sit down, relax, possibly vomit, maybe poop, and hope for the best. Now an obvious treatment is to simply stop consuming dairy. But remember, human beings vary in how much dairy they can consume. Lactase persistent people can likely consume as much dairy as they want and never experience a single symptom of lactose intolerance. But it's important to note that studies have shown that lactase persistent people who stop consuming dairy, what can happen is their lactase gene can downregulate. And then if they return to consuming dairy, they're not producing as much lactase as they once did and they can begin experiencing symptoms of lactose intolerance. So that has led some to believe and to just say outright that maybe those who are lactase persistent should always consume dairy so that they can always consume dairy, if that makes sense. Now for lactase non-persistent people, research suggests that most can handle one cup or 250 milliliters of milk per day without experiencing the nasty symptoms of lactose intolerance. But for some people, that's, that's not possible. Like any amount of lactose is going to create nasty symptoms. So obviously for them, just cutting dairy out of the diet is the best option. But as with everything, speaking with your doctor is of the utmost importance here, right? And figuring out what's best for you. But we also have to mention that we are really starting to understand the microbiome's role in potentially treating lactose intolerance because there are bacterial species that can live inside the gut that don't, well, they consume lactose, but they don't produce as byproducts those gases that contribute to the nasty symptoms. Instead, they produce lactic acid. So this could mean that a real nice treatment is just maintaining a good, healthy gut microbiota. But again, science is still working to figure that out in its entirety. But it's exciting nonetheless to know that maybe, you know, for people who are more lactose intolerant or lactase non-persistent, maybe just working on your overall gut health could allow you to eat more ice cream. Thanks for watching everyone. If you enjoyed today's video, please consider giving it a like. When you like a video, YouTube is more likely to recommend it to other viewers. So you'd be doing us a huge favor. Also be sure to click the link in the description below and begin your AG1 journey today. But again, just wanna say thank you for watching and hanging out with me for a bit. I'll see you in the next video.